Thank you everyone for attending this meeting. Uh, as promised, uh, we plan to give you an overview of information that uh, the Public Safety Committee primarily and the entire legislature had in making uh, the decisions that we've made to date on the jail renovation project. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, it is going to be uh, as comprehensive as can be uh, and primarily given by uh, a panel. Most of the folks are right here on this side. Um, we would ask that uh, we hold uh, any questions until the end. We're, we're looking to have some time for a, uh, a dialogue of, uh, back and forth. And uh, this is scheduled to get over, uh, as every meeting is, uh, after two hours, which would be 5.30. Uh, however, that's not uh, hard and fast. Uh, of course, we're not going to stay here till 8 o'clock, but uh, uh, we want to have everyone leave here with as much information as possible. So, um, like I said, that will be at the end. Uh, I guess I'd like to start by... Uh, introducing the folks that are up here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian Robinson, and I'm the, the lucky person that gets to chair this committee uh, for this year. Uh, Peter Stein, to my right, is the vice chair. Jim Dennis, right here. Leslin McBean Claiborne will be here in 10 minutes. And that's not David McKenna. It's actually Pam Mackesy that's on this committee. And there's Pam right there. <laughs> What's that? Are you talking about this isn't me? <laughs> no, you, you are you. You're okay. not David. Oh, yeah. I'm You're you up me. there, yeah. Up you there are you. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Boy, I guess the year came and came early. <laughs> uh, next, uh, we have our presenters for today. Like I said, I've, I've introduced myself. Uh, Joe Mariana, the county administrator, uh, right here. If, if you folks could just kind of raise your hand so, so they know who you are. Our district attorney, Gwen Wilkinson. Uh, Judge Rowley, we expect here in uh, a little bit. Uh, Deb Dietrich, uh, executive director of OAR. Pat Buchel, director of probation and community justice. Susie Cook is the chair of CJATI, and Ken Lansing is the sheriff. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to you, Joe, if you want to get going. Thanks, Brian. Um, and if, just to kind of get things started, and we'll, we'll start at the end, and then we'll, we'll give you some perspective on this. But as you know, we're here talking about a plan uh, to renovate the jail. The plan would, uh, is intended to reduce our board outs in the jail by using an indoor recreational uh, room that is very little used uh, to repurpose that room to allow seven beds to be added and to replace that indoor recreation space with a sheltered outdoor facility. So in terms of the project that, that we have been talking about now for the past year, this is basically the, 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 the project that uh, is on the table. Um, our goal today is to really provide a better sense of context of the decision that, uh, that has led to this plan. I think when we look back and, and saw what had been presented uh, in the course of, of, uh, of this project, we realized it was a very small segment of a very long history of a commitment to alternatives to incarceration in this community that we really hadn't explained as a part of our decision-making process. So our goal today is to provide a better sense of context for that, some things that uh, were, were really on our table or in our minds as we brought this to a decision. So if we're looking at context, we should begin with history. And I see a number of people in this room who can attest to the, to the history of, of this county's rejection of big jail proposals. And there have been several big jail proposals. 
and those proposals have been consistently rejected by this county in favor of making meaningful investments in alternatives to incarceration. I see Tim Joseph here and Martha Robertson and Deb Dietrich and Pam Mackesy. I'm sure there are many others who fought these battles that go back over a decade to, again, reject the idea of a big jail in favor of spending money wisely on alternatives to incarceration. A good case study of that is a 2002 jail study. Uh, for, for a prop, I brought the culmination of that study that was done back in 2002. Um, that effort was triggered by state pressure to expand our facility to add beds. This is kind of a recurring theme in the, in the jail and prison system in the state. The state is often pressuring uh, governments to add beds. That's what triggered this study. And when the experts came to the county to project um, what we should expect in the way of pressures on the existing facility, they projected literally linear growth. So as you look at their charts and read their analyses, they proposed at that time, and it wasn't that long ago, about 11 or 12 years ago, at that time they proposed adding 120 beds to our 75-bed facility. At that time, that project would have cost the county $19 million in brick and mortar, I don't know how much more it would have cost for additional staff, but $19 million in brick and mortar. And when we bring those dollars forward, that's about $25 million in, in today's dollars. That was the start of a series of studies. There were several subsequent studies that were done in the middle part of the decade, the latter part of the decade. And in every case, the county consistently rejected the brick and mortar solutions in favor of increasing our investment in alternatives to incarceration. Now, in accepting that, in, in basically freezing the size of our facility, we accepted a risk. We knew at that time that if, if uh, additional beds weren't added, there was a risk of additional board outs if the state refused to grant an appropriate number of variances for us. So that was basically the risk that was assumed in taking that policy position. Well, I wanted to show you what the experts had projected in terms of the growth of our prison population, of our jail population. You can see the way it, it rose literally, literally from about 90 up to uh, about 145 over uh, that period of time, about 20 years. And to accommodate that size of population, the experts had recommended a jail that had 195 beds in it to allow for flexibility and classification and so forth. In terms of what our actual experience has been so far, you can see that we have departed from that linear path, that our population has been relatively stable over that period of time. In fact, we have declined from a blip that occurred in the middle part of the, the decade. I will tell you that I read a report that was written by Tim Joseph when, when this was, uh, the analysis was prepared, saying that we should not accept linear growth assumptions for the prison population. I keep saying prison, I mean jail. And we didn't. And, in fact, through the work that we've done here, we have been able to buck that trend. And, again, this shows you the actual prison the jail populations that we've experienced over the past decade. So how has that occurred? How have we avoided that linear growth of jail population? Well, we've looked at several steps that run along the path of the criminal justice system, from uh, arrest to bail to arraignment and so forth. And we wanted to share some of the statistics that relate to each of those. Joe, hang on, hang on just a sec. Okay. You all set? All set? Okay. Yeah. So we've, we've tried to pull data because we, we really believe that it's, it's important to look objectively at, at our situation and make decisions based on that and to share that with, with the, all of those involved. So beginning with the process of arrest, um, when you look at the statistics, you will find that we are uh, near the bottom of New York State counties in terms of arrest rates. If you look at the total arrest per thousand of population, so if you equalize by population, you can see that we rank 51st of 57 counties in New York State outside of New York City. And you get a sense in that chart of where we rank on that scale. You can see, again, many are, are, are significantly higher than us, and we are at the bottom 10 percent of all counties in New York State. Um, I know that a concern has been how many of the arrests that occur here relate to, uh, to drug offenses. So we took a look at 
misdemeanor drug arrests per 1,000 of population, so again, we standardize by population, we find that we're 45th out of 57 in the state. And even though we're not quite as close to the bottom as we're, we're in the other category, if you look at us compared to many other counties, you can see how, how far below the norm we, we are. And then if you look at felony drug arrests per 1,000 of population, again, recognizing that the a concern about how many people are in jail because of uh, drug-related charges, you find that we are literally at the bottom of the pack. We, are, we have the lowest felony drug arrest uh, among upstate counties uh, in New York State. So of the 57 counties, we rank 57th. If you look at drug arrests um, in counties outside of New York City and in New York State, state drug charges represent about 15 percent of all arrests. Here in Tompkins County, drug arrests represent only about 6% of all arrests. So in terms of highest charge, only 111 of the 1,700, almost 1,800 arrests in the county were drug-related. Now in terms of arraignment and bail, I'm going to turn this part of the presentation over to the District Attorney Gwen Wilkinson to talk about some of the parameters and considerations in the establishment of bail. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. Uh, Arraignment and bail are, and the setting of bail, are two of the earliest phases of any criminal case, misdemeanor or felony. Um, the issue of bail is governed by statute and the discretion of judges. The factors to be considered in the setting of bail are, are two, really. One is risk of flight and any factor that goes to risk of flight and the second is a new one that was established, established by our legislature only this year, which allows judges in domestic violence cases to take into consideration dangerousness in deciding whether bail needs to be set. There are statutory uh, rules about uh, the ability of judges to set bail. Uh, a felonies cannot have bail set. Anyone who has two prior felonies cannot have bail set. The court literally doesn't have the power to set the bail. For any defendant who does have bail set and who feels that their bail is excessive, they have recourse to something that's called, not surprisingly, an excessive bail review. That is available to every defendant, and it is conducted in a court different than the one that initially set the bail. So it would be a different judge considering the question of whether the bail was originally set at an appropriate level. Um, as far as arraignment goes, uh, arraignment is simply the designation for the portion of the case at which the defendant is made officially aware of the charges against him or her and uh, has the ability with certain level cases to enter a plea uh, for other cases uh, that opportunity comes later in the process. Uh, I think that about covers the high points. I'll be happy to take any questions on that that you may have later. And, and just, uh, just to hit the, the second point that's on the slide, uh, I think everybody here realizes that bail levels are really outside the purview of the county legislature. There's really not much we can, can do at this level with respect to influencing bail levels. It's all uh, outside of our system. Um, I wanted to spend just a minute or two to talk about kind of the next step in the process, which uh, also makes us somewhat unique in terms of the quality of service that we provide, and that is that if an individual is arrested and is unable to afford their own attorney, um, we provide that attorney. Now, that's, everybody does that. Um, but in terms of the way it's done in this county, um, it's, it is rapid and is with, with quality counsel. Um, many people don't know the difference between a public defender's office, which is common in many parts of New York State, and what we have, which is an assigned counsel program. Julia Hughes is here, who heads up that, that program for us. But it's, what we do is an assigned counsel program. It's different than a public defender's office. And, and kind of the, the mental image of a public defender's office, unfortunately, is often right, where they, they are often harried. There's often a high caseload that they carry. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, difficult environment. Here, we assign an attorney to an individual when they, are, uh, when, when, when they find themselves in custody and they are unable to afford counsel. We assign them private attorneys because we can, we can distribute those cases pretty evenly between a large group of attorneys. It means that we have manageable caseload levels. 
And as you can understand, the quality of representation that we can provide to an individual depends a lot on the caseload level that's carried by an attorney. And I'm going to show you some statistics in just a second that will show you how, how um, good we are in, in terms of that metric. Um, this county spends 20 percent more for defense than it does for prosecution. In many counties, that's an aspiration of a public defender's office or an assigned counsel program to spend, to, to have in the budget the same amount of money that's given to the prosecution. Here in Tompkins County, we spend 20 percent more for defense than we do for prosecution. I came from Onondaga County, so I took a look at their budget and found that there the DA receives 27 percent more funding than does their indigent defense program. That's probably the norm. In terms of benchmarks, how, how do we fare objectively? If you, if you accept the metric, is, is, how much do we spend per arrest? We spend the sixth highest amount per arrest for, for indigent defense. And importantly, we have the third lowest caseload per attorney level in the state of New York. Just another graphic to show you how, that, how we stack up or the yellow line there. This is brand new data that's been provided by the Office of Indigent Legal Services. It shows how close each county is to ABA caseload standards, national ABA caseload standards. You can see that we're, we're one of four that gets pretty close to, to what the absolute standard is. You can see quickly, how quickly the rest fall off and how far away from the caseload standard they are. That is a significant um, reflection of the quality of defense when caseload levels aren't staggering for the defenders. Another element of the process, and again, we're going along with, with the steps of the criminal justice process. And the next step we have is, is bail assistance, and Deb Dietrich is here to talk about that. Thanks, Joe. Um, OAR has been providing bail since about 1976 when it was founded, um, but it was private funds that were used for many, many years. There were uh, loans and donations made to the OAR bail fund. About a decade ago, the county made a commitment to put money into OAR's bail fund. And that has been a pretty steady commitment ever since. In addition to the bail fund, OAR does contribute. Next year, it'll be just over $200,000 for OAR's ongoing operations. And we've been, I've come to the legislature, I think, four times since I've been with OAR and asked for more bail uh, monies. And they've been granted each time that I've requested them. Um, there is a new statutory $2,000 limit on the amount of bails that can be done by a not-for-profit charitable bail fund. There was a law passed by the state last year that put a lot of new restrictions on um, bail funds, and uh, we have been working to comply with the law. Um, but OAR does bail up to $2,500 with a $500 uh, copay from the uh, client or their families. And that's how we're saying we're staying within the $2,000 limit. Uh, we also do require a cosigner on bails um, in excess of 1000 um, That is uh, waived um, on occasion after looking at a situation. If someone doesn't have a member of the family who can cosign or a friend who can cosign, uh, we look at other considerations to try to get someone out of jail. Last year, um, OAR um, got 68 individuals out of jail saving the county an estimated $459,000 in averted uh, board out costs. This year we've done um, 56 year to date, which is about a $340,000 savings. But we don't just do bail. Um, OAR's bail work is um, only a portion of what we do, and um, doing bail isn't just writing a check for the amount of bail. It's having a weekly check-in with um, our clients. It's helping them uh, find work or housing when they're out on bail. It's not just a, a writing of a check and, and uh, you know, saying, okay, there you go. We try to keep uh, contact with people that call in weekly. We do a lot of other things, too. Um, we do um, the assigned counsel applications. We're up at the jail four days a week. Um, and do the intake so that people can get rapidly assigned counsel. We also do applications for public assistance and um, applications for alcohol and substance abuse treatment programs. Uh, the drug court, um, um, there is a, a certified alcohol and substance abuse counselor at DSS um, who does the actual evaluation. We're not evaluators, but we do the paperwork that tries to get people into treatment. There's also a direct phone line from the jail to OAR 
um, because it costs so much now for people to call uh, from the jail to, to their families' homes. Um, and frequently, a credit card or huge deposits required by the fam you know, for the family to be able to get collect calls from the jail. So we have pretty constant use of that direct line and set up phone appointments for family members to come in and be able to talk to, um, to their loved ones. We also provide transportation two times a week for visiting hours for family and friends, and I've been doing that through a volunteer service for over 28 years. And uh, the, um, the Friends Society, the Society of Friends, has been a huge support in that. We also have a drop-in center that's pretty well utilized, and there's a computer there where people can come in to locate housing, jobs, and help us, ask us to refer them to other services. So OAR offers a pretty comprehensive range of um, services to both those incarcerated and those who are formerly incarcerated. Is it sufficient? No, it's not sufficient. There's more to be done as far as easing someone's transition back into the community. But um, we're very rare um, in having a bail fund. This county is one of the unique uh, few who have something like this. Uh, the Bronx Defenders just started one um, because one of our former um, interns went down to the Bronx Defenders to work and took it to the Bronx. Unfortunately, it was also that that created the state legislation, which puts a lot more rules and restrictions on us. But at any rate, uh, there are other counties looking at our bail fund um, now, but um, Tompkins County has been really at the forefront. That's all. Um, many of you in, in making comments about our plan have talked about alternatives to incarceration. Um, you're preaching to the choir. This is a county that has committed itself to alternatives to incarceration that run deep and, and broad. Um, Pat Buschel, who's the probation director, is here to, to give an overview of, of the programs that we currently do. Thank you, Joe. Um, first of all, I'd like to start out by saying that probation is the largest alternative to incarceration sentence that's used by the criminal courts. I checked our stats today. We currently have 660 open supervision cases within Tompkins County. Um, and also, it's very important to know that, um, yes, we are very committed to alternative programming uh, for probation-eligible cases. And at any time, and there's a written policy in the department that at any time, a probation officer. Actually, Pat, Pat, hang on just a sec. No problem. You have committed to be all of us in I was actually waiting to see which one of you guys was going to give first and, and yeah. drop your arm. No. No, nothing. That was that was tough work. I was sitting here watching that. That's got to be. Yep. Okay. I think we're all set. Yep. Um, as I was saying, the uh, probation department operates a ATI, Alternative to Incarceration Screening Committee, and at any time when a probation officer is considering a sentence of incarceration for an individual, whether it's at the violation of probation stage or at the pre-sentence investigation stage, um, all probation eligible cases must be screened by this committee, which is made up of a supervisor and two senior probation officers. And the case is presented to the committee and run through all the alternative programming that is offered within the department um, for consideration. So you heard Deb Dietrich talk about OAR and um, the bail fund program. We also offer a pretrial release program through the probation department. I have a probation assistant who goes up to the jail every day, Monday through Friday, and she interviews anyone who has been um, uh, committed there and has bail set, and if they agree to the, to the interview, they are interviewed. Uh, she collects all kinds of social information from the person, and she comes back to the office and contacts employers and family members to determine their ties to the community. We also run the case through an actuarial risk assessment that 
tells us the risk level of failure to appear in court. And we gather all that information and make a recommendation to the court, and there are a number of different recommendations we can make. We can recommend that the person be released on their own recognizance. We can recommend that they be released under the supervision to probation, whether that's directly to that, where they have to check in with her up to once to five times a week, or they can be released to probation under electronic monitoring, or they can be released to probation to the day reporting program, so a number of options there. We can also recommend reduced bail or continue bail. So the judge gets that report and uh, makes a decision regarding uh, release status pretty early on in the process, basically their first appearance back to court. The Service Work Alternative Program is our oldest ATI program. It's been around since the mid-1980s. started out very small, but now it's a, a program where we offer uh, a supervised community service program every day of the week. Um, it is for our low-risk offenders on, and nonviolent offenders, and it can be used uh, initially at sentencing as an alternative to jail, or it can be used as a graduated sanction for noncompliant behavior during their period of supervision. So we may end up violating someone, taking them back to court, and recommending that they do community service as a sanction instead of doing jail time. So that's how that works. Okay, our greatest risk caseload um, formally was called intensive uh, supervision probation, but this is reserved for offenders who have lengthy legal histories, who have failed at prior probation sentences or have failed at substance abuse treatment in the past, and who also score as greatest risk of recidivism and violent recidivism based on our actuarial risk and needs instrument. That's um, a state instrument that is uh, given, given to us by the Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives to use in making these decisions. So the, uh, the idea behind the greatest risk caseload is that the caseloads are smaller and it allows the probation officer to provide very intensive monitoring and addresses errant behavior early on. And it also allows the probation officer to return the, the, the case to court immediately um, so that we can, again, look at possibly other programming, alternative programming, for them to get them back on track. We also offer the day reporting program, which is located in the Community Justice Building. It's a structured program that operates from 9 in the morning to 1.30 in the afternoon. It's kind of uh, like a classroom setting where um, it's very structured throughout the day. There are different uh, classes and activities that they have to um, attend. Uh, we offer substance abuse education, there's a life skills, GED instruction, and employment services are kind of the key components of that program. Uh, participants are mandated to attend by the criminal courts as a condition of pretrial release. So someone could be released from the jail into day reporting so that they're given a little bit more oversight. It can be a condition of probation or a conditional discharge, and it can be a drug court sanction. We also offer the service to parolees who may be coming out, and the parole officer thinks that that may be a good uh, stepping stone for them. Uh, length of program varies uh, according to the court. The judge has the discretion to order uh, any number of days. And again, we use this as a graduated sanction for noncompliance in lieu of incarceration. It can be used at the violation of probation stage for someone who just needs that added extra monitoring and supervision. Um, we are committed to day reporting. We are going to be um, housed in the Human Services Building very soon. Uh, we're very looking forward to being in the Human Services Building and having probation all under one roof. It's, it's going to be a, a great asset to, to the community. And we are slated to start that in 2014, we hope, about 18 months. We should, we should be up and running. Electronic monitoring is yet another ATI option that we offer. It's an ankle bracelet that uses cell tower and GPS to restrict and track an offender's movements. There's a lot of rules um, with this program. A person has to agree to follow the rules. They have to be able to agree to their in and out times from their homes. Um, the probation officer uh, tracks their movements through a web-based program and we get to see where they are, and it's pretty much real time. It refreshes every five minutes. 
so we can see exactly where they are. We know when they're not attending things that they should be attending. Um, we know when they are in areas they're not supposed to be in and when they are in areas that they are supposed to be in. So it's, it's a good monitoring uh, tool. And finally, we have the drug courts. And what we offer here are two drug courts. We have a misdemeanor drug court and a felony level drug court. Misdemeanor drug court's been in operation since 1998, and the felony level uh, drug court began in the year 2000. Uh, this is also for high-risk offenders. It's designed to break the cycle of addiction and criminal activity. Um, the idea is swift and consistent responses to errant behavior, and it encourages positive behavior, the whole goal being to reduce recidivism. So here today we have Judge Rowley. He provides the judicial oversight for the felony drug court. And it's a team approach where the probation officers provide the probation supervision, the judge provides the judicial oversight, and along with that there is substance abuse treatment, regular drug testing, the participant is given employment and education services, and there's use of graduated incentives and sanctions, including some of those ATIs that I just spoke about. Judge, would you like to make any further comments? Sure. About that? Um, thank you. I apologize for uh, getting over here late. Um, and, and let me just say by way of uh, introduction that um, I'm uh, grateful to see community interest in our alternative to incarceration program. We've been at this for 25 years, um, and uh, we need all the help we can get. The uh, issues related to incarceration are complex um, at their core. I think we all recognize poverty, racism, um, sexism. There's all sorts of uh, poverty. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think, is uh, one of our biggest indicators, but we've got uh, problems that are bigger than us. And uh, we have been very creatively working on this for a very long time. I was just jotting down uh, four programs that have come and gone because uh, we tried them and they didn't uh, accomplish what we hoped to, but uh, we've got at least a dozen programs that are up and running. The drug courts, uh, we were innovators in all of the drug courts. We actually have three operating and uh, two other specialty courts, compliance courts, um, and they largely operate uh, invisible to the community, and it's unfortunate because it's a remarkable effort and it's accomplishing remarkable things. There's 65 defendants right now supervising the felony drug court. These are all uh, prison-eligible defendants who are in the community because they're uh, being supervised by a highly experienced group of uh, professionals who come together uh, on a weekly basis to... Uh, collaborate on uh, the supervision. The uh, goal of the Felony Drug Court is to help people succeed with uh, achieving long-term sobriety and therefore uh, not repeating the uh, felony criminal offense or behavior that they've already engaged in. And in fact, the uh, 66 that are in the program right now are uh, the highest risk. There's a lot of people that don't qualify because the probation department has lesser levels of supervision. This is a very high level of supervision, high level of intrusion, and um, it has uh, a lot of success and a lot of uh, uh, data supporting the success of the model. The uh, city drug court uh, was opened in 1998. At that time, it was the first um, small city outside of New York, first small city, and the first uh, upstate city to have the uh, drug court program um, outside of Rochester, um, been a very successful program as well. We also have a family treatment court, which has 45 parents in it. While not directly related to alternatives to incarceration, we're still talking about a similar population of um, addicted parents whose children are in the foster care system, and they're seen in court on a weekly basis um, for up to a couple of years with the goal of trying to reunite families. Uh, I also run uh, a sex offense compliance court this uh, represents uh, sex offenders who are in the community and not in state prison uh, because we're hoping that with the strict level of compliance and the participation in the treatment process that they can uh, both uh, make the necessary changes and do it without uh, putting the public at risk. It's a pretty risky business 
um, but we uh, have been doing this for three or four years. We haven't yet had a defendant uh, reoffend while uh, in the program. We've had technical violations which have resulted in uh, resentencing. Um, and finally, there's the uh, Integrated Domestic Violence Court, which has about 100 cases in it currently, and that's, a, uh, again, a collaborative effort to bring together um, the various community partners uh, to try to uh, enhance safety for victims of domestic violence and to uh, hold offenders accountable by regular compliance appearances. They appear in court every, every month before me to see whether or not they're in compliance with the orders of protection and with the other uh, orders of probation or conditional discharge. Um, so, as you can see, I've got a lot to say about alternatives to incarceration. I've got a lot of uh, history with it, too, and I'm not even the uh, uh, person with the oldest involvement in this, but uh, that's the uh, first two cents I want to offer. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Um, in terms of how we monitor um, how we're doing with the alternatives, we have an organization called CJATI. Susie Cook chairs that group, and Susie, if you can... Explain here what, what CJATI is all about. Thanks, Joe. Um, the CJATI, it's Criminal Justice and Alternatives to Incarceration. It's the board for, I think it's this one, um, that the county has. We started with the Criminal Justice Board in 1975. And then in 1984, when the county created the Alternatives to Incarceration Board, Shortly thereafter, the county realized these two operate together, so they combined them. And that's when we became CJATI. On that board sits 22 people, which is every spoke in our criminal justice wheel. It is the judges. It's probation. It's mental health. Um, started out with 15, and as the need has grown, we've put more people on this board for youth services, CDRC for mediation, um, mental health. Uh, and, and a bunch of people at every point. We try to monitor the jail population, look at our ATIs, see how they're doing. Um, we're supposed to meet quarterly under a state mandate. We choose to meet monthly because we think there's a lot of uh, work that we can do. One of the things that we undertook as we're looking at you know, how our system works and how can we grease the wheels to make sure things are working well is we did a strategic action plan in 2007, which was going through. We pulled all the key players in and met to see exactly how can we improve things? Where do we need to do things better? And out of that, it was a year long intensive process. One of the things we found was that we have great ATIs and we need to make sure that people know about them. We wanted the magistrates and justices and people to know what we had available so that they use that. And in an effort to do that, probation director Pat Buchel, and she has even before she was director, gone out to the magistrates and she's done a manual for them to see what services we have that they can draw upon as an alternative instead of uh, jail. One of the other things we did was uh, looked at, at trying to make outcomes better as people were discharged from the jail. So we looked at these re-entry type philosophies um, and now actually planning starts before they're discharged from the jail, looking at what resources they need when they come out, whether it's workforce uh, to help them uh, uh, try to obtain employment, uh, see what they have for housing, is there <coughs> substance abuse issues, um, and as part of the substance abuse piece, what we saw was that there was a lag in people who needed treatment and getting them out of jail and into treatment. So the county and the state put money towards a position that actually goes into the jail and does um, substance abuse assessments to see what people need. That information goes to the court, and they can more speedily move people into treatment and out of the jail. Um, we do have a very, very dedicated group of people who work very hard to monitor, um, and I think my state rep tells me we're one of the best in the state at what we do. Thanks, Susie. Um, I'm watching the clock, and I'll try to go quickly. I have the next series of slides. I'll try to go fairly quickly through there, but I'll, 
spend a little time on, on a couple that I think are really important. We, we understand that, that the work that we're talking about here today that all of you are interested in doesn't begin and end with the criminal justice system. This is a county that has committed itself to a broad range of human services to address needs as early as, as is possible, beginning with youth programs. Um, we spend more uh, in terms of our own money for youth development programs than the three largest upstate counties combined. We're committed to mental health programs and quality mental health programs, and this is a legislature that has recognized that and has, has made financial commitments to maintaining the quality of mental health programs. We, I think if you, if you understand this county, you know that we also support a very broad range of other human services. As an example, I pulled out a slide that shows our commitment to youth uh, programming compared to the largest, the four largest upstate counties in New York State in terms of per capita spending. So this may give a good reflection of our commitment to youth programs in this county. And we're not just talking about criminal justice. We're talking about an entire spectrum of programs. What's, what really counts is the result. Um, if all these ATI programs were just done for the sake of doing them, it would be one thing. But we think that they have had the right kind of result in terms of reducing our, our jail population. The incarceration in Tompkins is among the lowest in New York State. If you look at our population, again, standardized by, if you, if you look at the jail population standardized by the size of the county, you can see that we rank 53rd of 57 upstate counties in terms of the rate of incarceration. The ATI programs are working. They're reflected in this very low rate of incarceration in our county. We know that there was an interest in unsentenced individuals who were in the jail. So we also took a look to make sure we're okay there, too, and we rank exactly the same in terms of unsentenced as we do in total uh, jail population, 53rd of 57. This one's a little hard to understand. I'll go really quickly through it, though. What we did is to take a look at what the incarceration rate is in every county in New York State. And we said, okay, what if we had the same rate of incarceration in Tompkins County that they do in these other counties? And we found it pretty interesting that Allegheny County seems to have the largest rate of incarceration in upstate New York. So if we had that same rate as Allegheny, we would have 280 people in our jail. The red lines are neighboring counties. Broome County, for example, if we had the same rate of incarceration as Broome, we would have 254, Cayuga 241, Seneca 222, Chemung County. Again, if we had the same rate of incarceration as Chemung, 216 people would be in jail here. We drop down to Ontario. We often compare ourselves to Ontario, kind of college town. We would have, if at that same rate, 186 people in jail and so forth down the line until you get to us. Our average population, based on state data and our own, is 90 people in jail at any given time. So we think this reflects the proof in the pudding of the effectiveness of the ATI programs, so that the rate of incarceration is very low. In terms of lengths of stay, we looked at it because uh, the, the numbers are, you'll see in a chart here, you need to look at it as, as the median stay is eight days. The average is 21 because some people have been in there for some time. So the average is 21 days. The mode, most people are in there for one day or less. And there's the graphic of the lengths of stay for unsentenced individuals. And you can see how it skews far to the left. The most people who um, find their way to our jail are released within one day. You can see how it trails off after that. So that brings us to today, and I'm going to ask Ken Lansing, the sheriff, to, to just kind of explain where we are today, and then I'll take it back and talk about some process things. First of all, I, want, uh, I may be the new sheriff, but um, I've got a lot of experience when it comes to CJATI because I was uh, a member of that board while I was the chief of police in the Cuga Heights for 10 years. So I know the, the commitment this county makes, and I agree with it 100 percent, and uh, I've backed it even when I was just the chief of police uh, in Cuba Heights. Um, with that being said, also, uh, since we took over as a sheriff, uh, we have accommodated many great programs that have been brought to us uh, by various agencies and, and religious uh, groups, and uh, we've done our best to make sure that they can come to our jail and uh, give the programs necessary to give the uh, necessary stuff for hopefully the people that are in our jail not to have to come back and they have the skills to live a better life when they leave our, our population. With that being said, uh, as you can see up there, we're licensed uh, when this uh, jail was made uh, for 75 beds. Uh, the state variance, which is uh, 18 beds that they allow us to have, but we have to file for that every six months. 
And uh, at any time, they can pull that. Um, and they did at one time, unfortunately, uh, for the previous uh, uh, years of 04, 05, and 06. And it cost the taxpayers of this county a lot of money. Um, uh, and uh, we don't want to see that again. And that's one of the reasons that our staff started thinking about what can we do. I met with the commissioner um, in January of 2011, shortly after I took over, and just to get an idea of what Albany expected from us. And uh, they wanted to see some kind of movement. And uh, I promised them, though, that we weren't going to build a new jail. I knew that that was not something that we really needed here, that we'd do our best to accommodate the population with the existing jail that we had. So our staff did start thinking outside the, the box a little bit of how we might be able to do that. And uh, this is why this project has come about. And another reason this project has come about is that the average shows that we average eight board outs. Um, obviously, the seven beds uh, you know, leaves us just short of one. Um, is it going to cure everything? But it surely will help a lot. And the biggest thing for us is it's very difficult for us to decide who we're going to board out. First of all, we know the impact on the inmates and, the, and their families, also their legal uh, counsel, uh, the difficulty. In fact, today I got a phone call from a local attorney concerned about how he's going to represent one of his board outs, um, and I promised him that I would do my best to take care of that, and I have made the arrangements to take care of that. Um, so we are concerned, and we do care. And this project came about because of that. We do care. And uh, as you can see, um, this is why we felt we needed to give you seven beds. Is something I want to do, uh, spend more money? Uh, no, but it, it's not. It's going to save us money. And it also will prevent the hardship that comes upon our people that end up being a part of our jail population. So that brings us to kind of where we started. Now I'll, we have a few more slides. We'll get through them fairly quickly. But, again, it, it brings us to the proposal that we're, we're discussing today, which is to, to uh, repurpose that recreation space inside to add seven beds and then replace that space with a sheltered outdoor facility on the larger grounds in the, in the back of, of, the, of the jail. Um, a question has arisen about costs. Several of you ask about costs and how we're going to pay for it. Um, the design and the estimated construction cost is $900,000. You've asked how we're going to pay for it. We will borrow the money. We will fold that into a probably a larger borrowing. We would expect to borrow it over a period of 20 years. Right now, conservatively, the interest rate we've assumed is 4%. could be less than that, but we've assumed 4%. And if that's the case, then our annual debt service would average about $65,000 a year. Then the question is, what's the, what's the net out-of-pocket cost to the county if we do that? Well, it depends on how many people you think we can avoid boarding out because of this expansion. And rather than to make any, any kind of prediction, this is kind of a pick em. So if you look at this chart, and by the way, the hard copies of this are in the back of the room, and it will be on the web page as well if anybody wants to see it. So if, if you believe that we will only avoid one board out, that means that we would save $29,000 in board out costs. That would go against the $65,000 expense of borrowing. So the net cost of the county in that case of a low board out uh, impact would be $36,000. And then you take it all the way up. If we can avoid seven board outs, we can fill all those beds with avoided board outs, then the county could actually save $138,000 a year if that's the assumed reduction of board outs. So it does look as if, if we make this investment, we can, we can save money. We can also improve the, the quality of life for the individuals who would not be boarded out in another county. The last series here, there has been a concern about uh, how public we've been in the discussion of this plan. So we went back and, and did a really quick review of what's in the public record, what's on the web page. And um, so it's clear we've been talking about this in some detail for over a year. We began in September of 2012 when the sheriff and undersheriff came to the Public Safety Committee to, uh, to discuss this, this back-of-the-napkin concept. Uh, we then took it to another committee. We then kind of took the, the planning farther. In February of 2013, there's updates. Um, we got uh, more serious and more formal as 2013 went on to the point of in June there was a formal presentation of the LaBella plan to the, to the Capital Plan Review Committee, followed by the presentation of the same plan of public safety, followed by uh, an approval of the plan by public safety. We did a full legislative presentation in the middle part of August before a vote. 
uh, two weeks before a vote. We then brought it back to budget for approval. And on, December, on September 3rd, the legislature approved the plan. So you can see the progression of, of public uh, review and, and public discussion. In terms of the next steps, um, there will be a, a, a review of the final design by the Public Safety Committee. We expect this will happen over the next few months. Those of you who have been attending these meetings know that I've said it's my expectation. We'll be back sometime in the springtime for a binding resolution after we have final designs in plan and, and would ask the legislature at that time to finance the project through the authorization of a bond. And that's, that's okay. what we've got. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think I'll, maybe I'll defer to uh, the longest standing uh, person here who has the most experience with th this uh, entire sphere of uh, the criminal justice system, and that, and that would be uh, uh, Judge Rowley. Do, do you have any uh, last words before we get going on the public part of it? Well, let me just say with regard to the beds themselves that... Um, um, you know, if, if we come up with some new ideas and we're able to impl implement some proposals over the next few years to uh, even further reduce incarceration, uh, that would be great. But right now, it, it frankly is a uh, human rights problem that we're using boarding out as our uh, strategy. Um, I, you gotta be, I think you have to be practical about this. There's over 20 judges in Tompkins County who are putting people in jail. Now, there's no one place to say uh, this is the problem, this is not the problem, it's this judge or that judge. This is a system, and the system is complex, and uh, when you crunch the numbers, you've just seen them. We've got too many people uh, on a daily basis, given the variances and all that. I'll, I can tell you, and I hope you can appreciate, what a deprivation it is for a person who's already... Uh, being deprived by the fact that they're incarcerated, that they are not incarcerated locally. Uh, where visitation cannot occur, the evaluations cannot occur, the uh, consultation with attorneys, the GED program, any of the programs, the AA meetings, NA meetings, none of those things. These folks are sent to Shenango County, sent to Broome County, they're sent to wherever has got an open bed. And these decisions are made on a daily basis and they're made depending on how many uh, people under 21, how many females, how many people have to be segregated for behavior reasons or mental health reasons. So it's a complex thing that happens. The bottom line is that these vans are running constantly, and uh, it's a disaster. Um, so this part of the plan where we say, you know what, looking at these numbers, we need these beds so we can have the flexibility of keeping Tompkins County residents or Tompkins County inmates within Tompkins County, I think this is the easy part. Um, improving the quality of the recreation space, um, that's the easy part. The hard parts are, you know, the, the bottom line issues. What are we doing with these, this many people in there? I don't care what the other counties are doing. Um, we do a lot of things different than other counties, and we're, we're almost at the lowest level of incarceration. Let's keep pushing it. Uh, we've got to balance a lot of things. Um, but uh, if we've got new ideas, better ideas, uh, revisiting uh, ideas, we are open to it. We, we meet every month and we review these things, and uh, we'll, we'll keep pushing it. But on the issue of just this project, this project, um, failure to do this is, is a violation of the rights of Tompkins County citizens who end up uh, in the Tompkins County Jail. Thanks, Judge. Um, Back a month or so ago, um, you folks came out. Uh, you had a lot of questions for us. Uh, we promised to give you answers. Hopefully, we gave you uh, a lot of answers here today in this presentation. Um, we do have some time. Uh, I've got three folks signed up right now that would like to speak. I would suggest uh, you, you have three minutes. Uh, it's just like any other public comment. Um, being that we have the luxury of having the folks in attendance who uh, supervise a lot of the programs that, that people have had questions about, uh, I would suggest that, that if you have a question, uh, ask it uh, versus, uh, you know, giving a statement. You, you can do what you want. 
in your three minutes. Um, but if you have a question as it pertains to this project, uh, by all means, ask it. Um, I appreciate the fact one of the things that we asked was that um, uh, insofar as you could to try to submit questions ahead of time uh, for consideration for this presentation. And, and you've done so. Um, and, uh, of course, we can't go word by word on every question that was, was submitted. So we kind of uh, uh, juxtaposed them, if you will, into some subject areas. Um, and let me just hit on some if uh, hopefully they've been answered, but if not, keep it in the back of your mind. That may be a, a question you'd want to ask uh, one of the panelists here. Um, did you study the jail population to know who is serving time so that you could figure out to reduce the unsentenced population? Um, that is ongoing. It's, it's ongoing all the time. It's ongoing especially uh, when we go to CJATI meetings uh, every month. Uh, it's done daily by the correction staff, by uh, Lieutenant Bunce and his staff. Um, so hopefully that, that was answered. Uh, are you maximizing your use of alternatives to incarceration? Um, we certainly think we in Tompkins County think uh, that we do alternatives to incarceration better, even, even much better, than uh, other counties in the state. Um, and, and that's evidenced by the, the low rates of incarceration. Uh, why don't you invest money committed to the renovation into ATIs and mental health programs? Again, uh, you can ask the question, but, but I think it's been stated um, that, that we do. And let me, uh, let me just say that um, because we think we do uh, doesn't mean that you think we do. So, again, if, if you have questions on that, uh, by all means, uh, ask them. Uh, is the jail population dominated by those in for petty drug crimes? I think we've already answered that. No, that's, that's not the case. As a matter of fact, only 6% of the arrest, arrests total are uh, drug-related, uh, as uh, compared to 15% of the rest of upstate New York. That's, that's theirs. And uh, as you saw from the slides, uh, felony drug arrests, are the lowest in New York State. Uh, next question, uh, do we have an unusually high level of unsentenced inmates? Uh, that answer is also no. Outside of New York City, about 60% of inmates in county jails are unsentenced. I mean, that, that is where you go before you are sentenced. That's... that's the, the way it works. In Tompkins County, we're actually only 53% as, as of last year. How much will the project cost? Several questions on that. Uh, I'm not sure. Was that in the presentation? Yeah. 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 Okay. I thought it was. But, um, but, but you're certainly welcome to ask uh, questions on that as well. And... No, this one doesn't make any sense, though. So will you have a public meeting to discuss this? That's what we're doing. So uh, I have three folks signed up, or four, I guess, right now. Again, um, you have three minutes, and if you want to ask a specific question to a specific person, uh, by all means do so. Martha, you got a question? or What's that? Should be getting light, too. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, and Susan Hatch said she had to leave, so. Yeah, go on. Nope. Uh, right up at the microphone, please. Well, 
I'm here to support the work of public safety agents. There are a lot of them in the community, but to also restate how important the role of community members is to their work. Uh, I'm thrilled that younger members have come to speak about these perspectives. That is younger than me. <laughs> I was a part of a county review of the public safety in Tompkins County years ago. That review brought together many community agency perspectives and much data so that a picture of the strengths and weaknesses of the system did emerge in facts, in, in, in facts, a picture that could inform the county about when, what improvements were necessary. Better alternatives to incarceration programs and policies were the result. In the intervening years, however, county personnel, defense attorneys, the district attorney, judges, and justices of the peace on many benches have changed. A new review would well would be advised to save the taxpayers of Tompkins County a million dollars. Furthermore, some staff and programs may have been cut that could be uh, refunded. Uh, staffing is key to these things, um, and the staffing in these kinds of programs is absolutely essential. I suspect that there can be improvements when I hear that 50 more, and 50, you say it's 53 percent of the jailed members of the community are local, have local family and community connections and roots and support that can't make bail and are in jail awaiting a court date. And often, and we need to know how often, many are released without a conviction. This points to a need for a review of the timetable and the processes of jailing. It points to more promotion of community intervention at earlier times would be a good thing. I support the consideration of the Burlington, Vermont program that you're looking at and whatever else comes from a real factual review of the system as a whole. This is too important and expensive a decision to make without a full examination of all the facts. And there are some facts here, but a lot of them aren't absolutely precise. You need even more facts to satisfy a community that's really ardent about this. Thanks. Uh, Francis Carver. Uh, I'm going to wave my three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Nagel. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mecca Nagel. I'm from Cortland, but I was, uh, uh, it's a bit of a deja vu. Uh, some ten years ago we were at this um, uh, two times, and uh, we thought we prevailed and really settled for ATI. Since then I have also wisened up. I th wrote a few academic books on jails and prisons, and I have uh, uh, keep my head out for international strategies um, to reduce um, jailing populations. Um, so, um, first of all, you mentioned the length of stay, uh, LOS um, 21 days, the medium the most um, being one day. Um, this is actually not different from other um, jurisdictions. I've just went through a big uh, file of the California system on assessing your jail uh, population. Um, it's the exact same number, right? Um, and I'm just wondering, given uh, the fabulous efforts that you folks have done um, that uh, Judge Raleigh mentioned uh, in the, at least in the last decade, if not more, on uh, alternatives, um, couldn't we reduce that even more so that the median would be one day, if at all, right? Uh, so that's uh, one consideration. Uh, the, my, my main point here is really to look at justice reinvestment uh, strategies, and I have a lovely cartoon on that, um, what it would mean to um, decarcerate, to focus less on police, prison, jails, and courts, and to invest in uh, jobs, housing, quality schools, um, urban gardening, uh, clinics, free clinics um, for drug treatment, mental health, and uh, children's programs, to say a few. We actually, um, to share with you um, uh, some ideas, there's the Center for Community Alternatives that's um, located in Syracuse and elsewhere in the state, um, and uh, the headline here for the annual report is CCA gets results, and they are rather impressive. My question to you all is um, in terms of the success rates that uh, Judge Raleigh um, 
uh, you know, you, you lined out, you know, the, the various courts, alternative courts, which are still punitive, right? You're not succeeding, then you're going back to jail. And to folks involved in the decarceration movement, that, um, you know, mandatory approach is still rather negative, and the success rates tend to pale in terms of other more strength-based programs, such as CCAs. Um, CCAs cost an, an average of $11,000 per participant. It's not cheap, but you get 90% of the youth participants that are not re-arrested for at least one year after their enrollment, and many of them uh, volunteer in the organization. Um, one consideration, too, is, of course, um, that I'm sure OAR deals with uh, the permanent cast of outcast people, right? Um, we don't have to read Michelle Alexander to understand um, those Issues. So I ask now if uh, Tompkins County has uh, considered a ban the box. Um, I can't read. Are you, am I, it says um, time's up. But time's up. But go yeah. ahead and wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a ban the box, um, I'm working that within SUNY. I'm employed by SUNY Cortland, um, so that one doesn't have to disclose one's criminal history when applying to college. Um, but uh, many cities around the country have uh, instated such a uh, program for employment opportunities so that uh, people really, truly can get a second chance. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hang on just a sec. Could you, could you go back? Um, are, are you going to be forwarding that material? I, I, that would be my pleasure, sure. Okay. I would. Yeah, you can make arrangements to do that. Does anybody want to... Uh, just raise your hand if you want to comment to it. Go ahead. Um, the organization that she just mentioned, the Center for Commun Community Action um, through Onondaga County, our program has just applied for a grant with them, and we are going to be contracting with them for next year, starting next year, for a defender-based advocacy program. Mm -hmm. And we uh, applied for that money this year. We should be starting in January with that program. Very good. Uh, Brian, I've got a couple comments. Yep. And we had that program about 15 years ago. It was very effective, and then it got caught in the squeeze, and um, that's what happens with the cycling of these things. Um, I, you know, on the, uh, the large request of incarceration, I mean, um, obviously it's a stubborn issue, and it's true. I mean, these are all coercive by nature. These are uh, individuals who have uh, uh, committed uh, felony offenses, when we're talking about felony uh, uh, drug court, and... Um, and if, they're, if they've already, if they've failed on probation before, they've already been to state prison, um, then uh, we're still admitting them to the drug court program, especially under the new judicial diversion law, which allows the judge to use the discretion to allow someone into drug court, even though they're otherwise facing mandatory state incarceration. Um, um, but you're right. I mean, if they weren't committing the felony crimes, and we're talking about, um, mostly property crimes, but uh, if you've had your house uh, burglarized or if you've had uh, 20 houses in the neighborhood burglarized, which are some of the kinds of uh, folks we have here, um, you know, we, we have to at this point deal with the reality of incarceration. It's just uh, simply part of our society. It's, I think in many ways it's an ugly part of our society, but it is what it is. I can give you another example of where incarceration, uh, uh, where we fill up beds, and we've got the 19-year-old, uh, seven-month pregnant woman who's shooting heroin. Um, that's my case today. Um, you know, already been kicked out of drug treatment, um, homeless, there's no place to go, and um, already been on electronic monitoring, already been at day reporting, already been on interim probation supervision, already been incarcerated. Um, and so I can say, um, stay out of trouble till the baby's born. Or I can say, you know what, uh, you're going to get your, uh, the rest of your care up at the Tompkins County Jail, and when that baby's born is when you're going to be released. Um, you know, this is not always crystal clear. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, community issues that are involved here. This won't be the first clean baby born because I've said we're not going to continue to expose your baby to uh, heroin while you're uh, through your last few months of pregnancy. Uh, these are complex issues, and I'm glad I don't, I haven't heard any comments to suggest that you don't appreciate the, the audience, the complexity of this. Uh, this, is, this has taken our best thinking for a long time. And I don't know if Tim Joseph has said anything yet, but uh, Tim was one of the uh, uh, fiercest uh, opponents of jail expansion when, however many years ago, they said, 
160 beds is what you need in Tompkins County, and uh, you know, led the government opposition to that. And the, uh, I mean, it's kind of funny because back then it was fighting against those who insisted we had to build the bigger jail, and uh, we fought that back. And um, and now uh, we're absolutely uh, delighted to have renewed energy uh, to, to to look at this issue. Um, thanks. Paula Jonite. Thank you. Uh, it's Paula Ioannide, and I'm part of the Sean Greenwood Working Group, as well as the uh, Stop the Jail Expansion Coalition. I had uh, three questions. Um, one is for uh, OAR Director Ms. Dietrich. If you had more funds for uh, a new staff person, as well as more money for the bail program, would you be able to assist more people to uh, get out of jail? The second question is for Director Buschel, um, who talked about the pretrial release program. If you had more staffing as well as funding for that pretrial process, would you say that you could speed up the process through which you release people who met the qualifications to not stay in jail? Uh, in other words, speed up that process. And the third question I had was around um, the sheriff uh, for uh, Sheriff Lansing, and you mentioned the uh, need to show the New York State Commissioner some kind of progress on, in order to not pull the variance. Was that solicited? Uh, was that something that came from the New York State or something that you actually pursued with the commissioner uh, as a way to, you know, initiate this program in 2000 and, or this uh, proposed expansion in 2012? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to take those in order? I'll, I'll answer. Um, yes and yes. Um, we had one other client service worker until about three years ago when the county went through terrible fiscal times, and we sustained an elimination of one client service worker. Um, so if we had another client service worker, um, I think we could do 10 to 12 more bails a year. It's not astronomical, um, it, but it's uh, because the bail isn't just writing the check, as I said earlier. Um, but everyone sustained cuts during those hard economic times, um, and we, we certainly did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would say no to your question. Um, the probation assistant who is assigned to the jail, she has no problems conducting the interviews uh, of everyone who needs to be interviewed that day. She has no issues coming back to the office and completing those reports in a timely way. Um, also, sometimes in very short turnaround time, so that information is to the court by the time that person reappears before the judge. So um, I think that we are adequately staffed in that program. Thank you. And to answer your question, um, no, uh, as far as uh, was this a part of the plan, because I had no plan other than to find out what some of the problems were, why our variances were taken away, uh, so I could get a better grasp on what I may be able to do. There's no guarantee that this is going to guarantee that. Uh, originally, we were able to file for variances for a year. Now they've put the squeeze on us to do it every six months. Um, so, no, it, it had nothing to do with it. My, uh, a plan. I had no plan at that time other than I was going to try to help the taxpayers of this county not to have to experience the possibility of them taking our variances again. And there is no guarantee of that, uh, unfortunately. But uh, this idea came up later on. Uh, as I stated, I met him right after I took office. So. Sorry, I just had one more follow-up question because uh, it was mentioned uh, by Mr. Uh, Mariano. Mariano, sorry, uh, that this would be done on public debt. In other words, you would borrow the money uh, to do the jail expansion. Uh, and my question is, I mean, part of what's coming up for us is that alternative to incarceration programs, I'm assuming, but I'm, this is the question, can... Uh, public debt be used to fund such programs? In other words, do you actually have to have the revenues in hand if we wanted to assign a million dollars to OER, for example, or can that actually be borrowed on bond as well, or is that only for infrastructure projects? The latter. So we can only borrow for brick and mortar. We can't borrow for operating costs. That's why we're, we would borrow for this physical improvement, but we couldn't borrow a million dollars and give it to OAR. Could I, could I, though, kind of expand on Deb's answer to your question? I, th I think she was clear, and I, we tried to make it clear in the, in the presentation. 
when Deb says we need more money for the bail fund, we provide additional money for the bail fund. So that's not an issue. Her staffing issue is, is one thing, but in terms of an adequate supply of funding for the bail fund, uh, the legislature has been very good about responding to requests for mm -hmm. um, necessary funding. Yeah. It's just that there's something more sinister going on that we're highly aware of, one of which is that the New York State is increasingly displacing costs onto counties to build these jails, right? And I don't know if you are aware of this trend that uh, throughout New York State, after they've exhausted sort of state funds to build state prisons, right, now one of the new tactics is to displace these co costs onto counties with, you know, the New York State Commissioner, which I don't know if you're aware is a very unique uh, position. It doesn't exist in other states. And so I think part of what we're trying to say that maybe we're not communicating quite well is that we're trying to interrupt the logic that is a part of a larger national trend and that although I know on the ground here it looks like, you know, this is a good compromise, what we're trying to say is that you open up that little door, you're opening up the door to the larger logic. Um, so that's just for me to comment and not necessarily to ask. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Gino Bush. Hey, um, I, I want to ask you a question, Brian. Sure. At one of the meetings, I don't know if it was the last meeting, Shawnee asked you if you would come to the community, and you responded by saying, yeah, if, if the chief of police can come with you. I found that very disrespectful to our community and the community of people of color and poor people. And that you said this here is a community meeting today. It's not a community meeting because people from the community, they are not here today. They work in or, you know, they home or whatever. It's not people from the community. That's why I ask for people to come to the community and talk about these issues. But you don't want to. People don't want to. And the other thing I want to say is I want to thank Julia and Deb for the hard work they put in into their agencies. Unbelievable. I work with Deb. I'm on the board of directors at OER. I know how hard she worked to keep the 82 running. If it wasn't for her, it wouldn't be what it is today. And the same thing with the sign council, as far as Julia is concerned. Her hard work into that, into that agency is phenomenal. But I want to ask you folks, you folks want to stop bullshitting, come out in the community and talk to the people. You don't do that. People don't even know who you are. I'm so tired of that bullshit. The only one that comes out is Pam McAfee and, 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 and um, Ms. Claiborne. Those are only two people I see out in the community. The rest of you, I don't see, even see you or hear from you. Nothing. And I'm serving as a liaison between a lot of people. Today I was on the phone for over five hours trying to help two men get jobs who just got out of prison. They come to me and ask for help because there ain't nobody out here to give them the help that they need. So I say a lot of this is just a bunch of hogwash meant to make people feel good for a minute, and then that's it. But the people that are putting in the work, like the people in the Sean Greenwood Working Group and other people out here in the community, you just totally ignore, like we ain't nothing. And you ignore the people in the community. Thank you. Did you, uh, did, did you want me to respond? You, uh, you singled me out, so do you want me to respond? Okay. Uh, the young lady that you referred to was asking me to come to wherever, Southside or GAC or whatever, to talk about uh, basically the, the uh, segments of the population that are overrepresented in the jail population because they're the ones that are most frequently arrested. That's what she asked me. I she see, she I, also asked you to come out to the community, and you said you wouldn't come now. Right. You said, should no. I come with the chief of police? I said I would come with the chief of police because he's, they're the ones that do the arresting, not me, not, not the county legislature. 
But I mean, you, I'd be, I'd be you are part of the government of, the, of this county. That's what I'm talking about. Right. And you got a position here. You're making some money here, too, right? You're getting paid today, ain't you? From the county legislature. All, All right. y'all getting paid. So y'all need to get out here and do something. Okay. Uh, Judge? Uh, I had uh, two comments. First, uh, uh, Gino, that uh, uh, if you want... Uh, Judge to come down, just give me the invitation. I'd be happy to come down and answer questions at uh, Southside or wherever you want. Um, I just want to take the moment, though, to, and I appreciate the comments about the law, larger context. And I'm sure any legislature here can talk to you about the uh, push from the state to the local level. And uh, the director of probation can tell you about the uh, loss of state aid as the uh, responsibility for costs of uh, supervision have been borne more and more by the county. And so what's really happening when you see these numbers of uh, our surrounding counties, you're seeing choices by counties where they say, we can't afford to do this. If the state's not going to pay us to have probation um, do the quality job that they should be doing, then um, we're just going to incarcerate more people. We're, this county's putting the money in there making the choice to put the money in there. All these programs are making the choice to put the money in there. But it really is. You're right. The bigger picture is that uh, we're just lucky that uh, we've got the values we have and the work that we're doing and the coordination that we do. But uh, this is a disaster uh, statewide um, on a lot of levels. And if you really want to look for disaster, look at our state prison system. Now, we don't have uh, input into that. It's a remarkable how little... The uh, judge, who, there's only two judges in the county who can send people to prison. You know, there's 20 something who can send them to jail. But and we got to be clear about that. But when eventually prison is the sentence, um, we have virtually no say over where they go, what programming they get, when they get out, and most of all, we have no say over uh, what happens when they're released back to the community. Now, an intelligent approach where you had a reentry system, because um, reentry from the jail is important. Reentry from prison is essential. And uh, we've got uh, people who are doing, like, sh short-term incarceration, come out onto probation. They go into all these programs. They get all the support. I'm not saying we couldn't do better, but we've got a lot. There is nothing coming out of the prison system. Parole is, is not even babysitting. I mean, it's just checking in a couple times a month, peeing a cup. So we've got um, – and if you really want to look for an issue right now, look at the special housing unit abuses in the state prison system. And uh, judges have no say over that as well. Our, our prison system is uh, it's of great concern. And my, if I wish I had the time to try to organize county judges with regard to the conditions in the prison system, uh, because I, I think there's an awful lot of work that we need to do there. Um, so just since I had the soapbox for a minute, I thought I'd take it. Uh, Joanne Sapola Dennis. Hi, uh, thank you very much for coming out today, everybody. I really appreciate it. And is there a member of the Ithaca Police Force here, or is this just the Sheriff's Department represented today? Okay. So, uh, Judge Rowley, thank you for coming today. I, I haven't met you before. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, accepting Gino's invitation, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you go, and perhaps Mr. Robeson would join you as well as the Mr. Lansing and the Chief of Police of the Ithaca Department would go as well. Um, I just disagree with one thing you said, uh, Judge Rowley, and that is that you said that these problems are bigger than we are. I disagree, sir, respectfully. The problems that we have are, are our own doing, and we have to get to the bottom of them to solve them. So uh, some of them, uh, obviously, I think a lot of people here are going to talk about racism today. You're actually the only one that actually spoke that word. That's disappointing to me. Um, we have a lot of issues with racism, homophobia, that are driving uh, perhaps a, a capacity at the jail, that we need to address those quickly and completely. Um, exactly what are the total costs for the three-phase expansion in total? Mr. Marion, can you answer that question? For the, and this is kind of a. Do you want me to continue before I, I can my three right minutes now. is can, up? Or? You can answer. Okay. Yeah. The, the the expansion, the, the renovation that we're talking about now, the seven beds, for, to design them and construct them, the estimate is nine hundred thousand dollars. 
if we go beyond that, because there is a, a conceptual phase three out there that would require the sheriff to vacate the public safety building for all the civil and uniform services, vacate that building and then backfill that space with additional beds. I think the cost of, of it adding additional beds was relatively low. I'm recalling less than $200,000 just for beds. However, the cost of building new headquarters for the sheriff and the civil division and road patrol and all that goes with that would be quite high. I'm sure it would be significant, and we have not put a pencil to that. Is that a several million dollar, I would assume? It could be. Is that a proposal? I don't know. If, and again, at this point, I wouldn't want to speculate, but it's a, it's a cost that was not stated in the architect's estimates, okay. but it's a significant I think where cost. the confusion is is that it's been stated in the public as a three-phase expansion. Yeah. So we want to know the entirety of the funds that will be bonded, which then the taxpayer will have to pay by pay. By a ha uh, yeah, and I think we should be very clear that that third phase is very conceptual and very much in the future. Nobody is committed to do that third phase. Okay, so on the first one that we're talking about today, the 900000 um, that contingency is only 10%, and, and being a builder, I, that is really very, very low considering the, uh, the type of project you're talking about. So what happens when that 10% contingency is exceeded, sir? Well, you phrase that as when the contingency if is it, exceeded. Uh, let's say if it yeah. is. Um, we can go our, on if. Yeah, our goal is clear, would, would clearly be to keep it within that budget. Well, if I understand that. If that, we would have to come back the to the county legislature for additional authorization to pay the excess. Would there be any fees associated with that? Any fees? Yes, if you have a contingency well, and then you go above your contingency and then you have to go back to the taxpayer to form another bond. Well, there would be no account. extraordinary fee. We, we, um, if, if, and you, you're looking at a scenario here, if you had to incur additional costs, you would probably package that in with the overall bond. So you would spread that cost over the same life of the bond. So it would have some effect on the annual debt service for the project. Okay. Um, would the committee agree to a three-hour public conversation one evening so people don't have to miss work or a Saturday uh, every month for the first six months so we can bring uh, information to the board for consideration that might, in essence, um, differ your opinion on the entire project? Anybody want to address that? Are you willing to meet with the community in the next six months, one day a month, for three hours? I wouldn't commit to that. Uh, would you consider what I What I would commit to? Would you consider that? Yeah, we'll, we'll consider anything. One, one thing you need to understand, and I think it was one of your questions, uh, and it's kind of along those same lines, asking for... Uh, you know, what is the commitment in general of the Public Safety Committee to listen to the public, mm -hmm. not only about this issue, but, you know, any issue? Um, my, my answer is we, we operate under a committee system, and every year it changes. And uh, there, there is no guarantee that one or any of us are going to be on the Public Safety Committee for 2014. Does that change in January? Yes. And have you decided whether you would like to continue service for another year? Have I decided? Yes. I, public safety is my background, so... That's why I'm asking you. That's something that I would very much like to do. Uh, however, it's not my decision. I can, I can voice my... Uh, so is the committee chosen, or is it a volunteer? It, go ahead, Jim. Uh, let, me, let me answer simply. Uh, we elect a chair of the legislature every year. The chair of the legislature, in <coughs> a collaboration with the, with the new vice chair, makes up the committee. So n not one of us could say today strictly what committees we're going to be on. Uh, if we have a new chair of the legislature, which we probably will in in January, you know, it's all up for grab. Okay. And the last one is uh, for uh, Sheriff Lansing, who, who I've never met before. Um, how do you address the allegations of racism and targeting of the LBGDQ community in the city of Ithaca? And when was the last time that the police department 
uh, was trained on diversity issues, sir. What was the last part? I couldn't hear you. When was the last time the police department or the corrections, actually both of you, trained or retrained on diversity issues? I want to answer that. I'll have Captain Bunce answer that since he's in charge of the uh, corrections facility. He'll be able to tell you because he keeps track of those records. Yep. Um, obviously, I don't have exact right. training records, but we did uh, put the entire correction staff through diversity training uh, uh, approximately one year ago. And who did that this, uh, training, sir? Uh, In-house. So who, who was the trainer? And did you follow a, like the legislature just celebrated uh, their workforce diversity? So did you, were you trained by the same people? Or are, um, you, are you saying that you trained your own people? Yeah, I want to say that we had, our, uh, we had a lesson plan that we followed and mm -hmm. went through with all of our staff. And, and whose lesson plan was that, sir? I don't recall. Can you get that information to us? I probably could. Okay, thank you. Can I just, jo Joanne mentioned the city of Ithaca, and I think we should be really clear that the county sheriff department and corrections officers um, basically handle cases that are outside of the city of Ithaca. Maybe someone can give a better explanation of this than I can, but... Uh, it's, you'd have to go separately to the city of Ithaca for training and, and questions about their jail and their staff and their police force that, than to us. Yep. They do, but, so would somebody want to explain? Yes, they do. The overlap. You have two two separate and distinct uh, police forces. In one jail. Joanne, can you? You're not using a microphone. It's hard. Yeah. I said if we are talking about public safety here and the capacity in the jail and what's driving it, why isn't the Ithaca Police Department represented here today? I find that astonishing. And the other thing is, is I am a taxpayer. I like to pay my taxes. I would like my taxes to go towards more things like OAR, the Department of uh, Probation, and uh, things to keep people from getting arrested to begin with. Please consider those things in the future. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Natalie? Brian, may I say something real quickly to sure. Joanna? Sure. Uh, Joanna, I, I want to say real quickly, we can't speak for the police department, but in response to my friend Gino, I think that's why Brian was saying earlier in the public meeting, I would want to bring the police chief with me because that's where they should be able to answer some of those general questions about their participation in arrest and some of the things that you had as well. You know, not, you know, trying to pass it off, but saying the police should be there. We can't speak for why they're not here, but, you know, at a public meeting definitely, as what Brian was saying, the chief should, the chiefs, because it's not just one chief of police in our, in our area. I mean, we have a chief of police in Kierke Heights. We have chiefs in Trumansburg, you know. So to make sure that people are there as well. Natalie, I'm not going to try your last name. Nesva Durrani from Ithaca. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone from the community who came out here today um, in spite of work, schedules, other commitments for this public presentation inconveniently scheduled for 3.30 p.m. Um, uh, Brian, yes. I think that you and I are looking at the same list of questions, the one you referred to a bit earlier. It's listed one through eight. Do you have that in front of you? Um, I've got a few of them. I've got one, one through 21. <laughs> Here's one through eight. Okay, go ahead. 
Do you see it? It's the list submitted by Chantal. Yep. Um, you covered a few questions on this list that were sort of broadly addressed in the meeting. Um, could you address number eight now, please? Read it and answer. I please read number eight, and so it's not a mystery to everyone. I will. Uh, and I saw this one earlier. Finally, does a member of the Public Safety Committee have a conflict of interest in considering and approving this budget expansion? If so, has the conflict been formally disclosed to the public? Could you address it, please? What does that mean? Yeah. Could you explain what the conflict is yeah. to make it easier to answer? I mean, I, it's, it's just simply asking whether, as far as you know, is there any conflict of interest? Just, it's a simple question. No. Okay. Thank you. Yep. He's out of order. He's out of order. <laughs> Jamie Hendricks. Um, this, I have uh, two somewhat unrelated questions. Uh, the first question concerns the bond. Uh, Authorization of bond to finance the project by full legislator. Uh, what we were wondering was whether that is going to be a, a, a voter approved bond or whether uh, that is not the case. It's the latter. It's, it's not the case. So there are, there are some governments and schools that require voter approval for bonds. The county does not require that. It does require a two-thirds majority. Okay. Super a, a supermajority to pass a bond resolution. Yeah. Then I would like to repeat Joanne's question because I didn't think we get a clear answer. Why is it that the city of Ithaca police chief is not here today? Uh, I can answer that, I believe. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't see where the Ithaca city police chief would, would be here to answer questions about the jail expansion, and that's what this meeting really was about and what we're doing. Um, do they put people in our, our correction facility? Yes, they do. But uh, to be honest with you, in fairness to the chief, um, I see no reason that they would be here. They weren't invited, okay? And I know that I wouldn't show up at the city meeting unless I was invited, and uh, they weren't invited here. I think that's the simplest answer. They were not invited. They were not. Yeah. I see Jim Dennis has his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> uh, one comment, uh, something I learned earlier and actually knew before I came in there. Uh, police don't put people in jail. Judges do. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone has to hear that. Yes. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to just... Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martha, why don't you come up to the yeah. table? Just come on up to the table. Brian, could you, or maybe the sheriff, explain how many different law enforcement agencies there are in the county? Well, you've got the city. You've got every village has a police uh, department, uh, and, uh, and you have the state police. You have the New York State Park Police, and you also have the uh, conservation officer, DEC, uh, started by New York. So those are all the agencies here in this county. So. And two campuses. Two and two campuses. campuses. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, how can I forget them? The university. So, well, three campuses because DC three also. Yeah, and, and all of those agencies can arrest people and put them in front of a judge, right? That's correct. So, we we could have had all the agencies represented here, and only spent all, all of our time talking about arrest. But as you pointed out, that was this was about the renovation of the jail. And I, I mean, I think people have to understand that if there's a um, the problem with the Ithaca police that's separate and distinct from the sheriff's department, the data about arrests includes all of those agencies, right? Right. So that's how anybody gets um, in front of a judge in Tompkins County. Right. Yes. 
Um, Carol Chok, yeah. yeah. Yes. So I, I think that the, 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 these questions about how, how these various police forces operate and why would the county would assume that if people came to us to engage us in dialogue that, that we would expect that we would be the ones to engage in the dialogue um, sort of point to the need for a longer, more extended dialogue between us. I think there's a lot of information on both sides here that, that we spend a lot of time understanding all this. I mean, I've been here six years. Uh, I was on the pu Public Safety Committee my first couple of years, I think, uh, which happened to coincide with the whole review of the, the CJATI programs. Um, so I, I, you know, so I, it, I spent all year learning about these, and then I think that there's a whole body of literature and, and thought about the ways in which there's systematized problems in the country, in the state, in the world, um, and they're all useful, but it's the, the kinds of answers and the kinds of w ways that we sort of are like two ships passing in the night about, about some of the questions and the answers speak to, I think, the need for something a little more extended, but I, it also, you have to understand our process, uh, which, you know, the reason it came to this committee is this is the regular meeting time of this committee, and it's the appropriate place to have started the discussion. If we're going to, you know, engage in, in something more extended or in the community, that's something additional you set up, and I think, so, I don't know how to get there, but I, I am feeling the need to, to have, I don't know, it understood on both sides that um, to get to a place where you would understand in order to be able to uh, present um, alternatives that might work within our system that's already set up that could expand the approach that we're taking and respond to the kinds of questions you're raising, which are great questions, um, there has to be this, this movement on both sides to understand uh, how our system is already set up so that we can yes. then, you know, there's, for example, the, all of those agencies that Martha just was pointing out exist, there is a place that they meet that is, hasn't even been mentioned yet, which is the, um, I mean, you know, one place that, that representatives from all those forces come together is on the uh, ECROC committee. So there are yep. other, there are many venues and it would, t it would take a lot of work to the um, emergency communications. Okay. We, yeah. Right. So. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get with you. We'll yeah. get with you on yeah. that. Did you? I, I still have two questions and a very quick comment. I respectfully disagree with Sheriff Lansing about whether or not the Chief of Police needed to be invited to this meeting. There's a special entry of the City of Vitaka website where it logs all the arrests that have been made. And I didn't keep track of every day how many people get arrested, but I saw 40 arrests within a month's time and all the reasons they were arrested. So I think it's really important because we all know that the police officer has some discretion about whether or not he arrests a person. Like I've been stopped when my license was suspended. They didn't arrest me, but I see several people that got arrested. And by the way, that was in Broome County. That was not in Tompkins <laughs> County that this happened. Now, um, this, this for future uh, dialogue, I really hope that the city, the chief of police is part of this. Now, my last question was uh, when you showed the slides that show that Tompkins County was in 52nd or 51st position, uh, does, did it occur to you uh, to kind of say, gee, we want to be at the bottom, we want to be the lowest county, so what can we do? to reduce the supply of inmates to the jail population. Because we all know we can expand the jail, but if the supply goes up, then we still need to board out people. So we really need to think about reducing the supply. And, um, this, and that's a question for each and every one of you. Have you met with the par your partners in the other counties, or, or has this thought occurred to you during the last month? Like, uh, and that's also in response to what uh, 
Paula Ionides said, is that the, the state is pushing all these mandates on the counties, uh, just closing prison jails and, and wanting you to uh, take care of the problem with your local jail. So as each and every one of you started thinking about, we need to get together with our uh, other counties and kind of formulate a strategy to push back, push back to the state and say, hey, you cannot keep on doing this, sending unfunded mandates in our direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, Claire Brady. Yes. Actually, I was hoping each one of you would respond to this question, whether you have been thinking about this and what your plans are in the next two months. Yeah. Martha? Uh, we, we do participate with, in the New York State Association of Counties with every other county in the state, and uh, most of what we talk about is unfunded mandates. Uh, and, in fact, the, the ship has mostly left the... the uh, the train has left the station on jail expansions, I believe, in other counties where, uh, under Tim Joseph's leadership, we did push back. And um, we were the only, I think, maybe the only county that did. And the rest of them kind of sat around it's like, oh, my gosh, you, you said what to the state? And um, in the meantime, they were building their jails and spending hundreds, and, hundreds of millions of dollars and incarcerating many more people. So uh, I believe, uh, and maybe Ken, you can uh, correct me, or, or maybe Joe, about how many jails have been uh, either built or are in the process since we started this, since we pushed back 10 years ago. So um, it's kind of late. If they've already built a big new jail, they're not going to unbuild it. Um, you know, so I, I think we, we have been involved with, uh, with other counties, and, uh, and really Tim was, was – I would, was at several sessions where Tim was kind of leading the conversation to say, you really don't have to do this, but the rest of them did. Am I right? Yeah, no, the Tioga County uh, built a new jail. Broome County has built on to theirs, and I just talked to Sheriff Harder you know, about a month ago. They're going to be adding more. Uh, Shimong, they've uh, enlarged their jail. Uh, I know Cortland's taken a stance, but I don't know so much they're taking a stance just only because of financial reasons, I'm sure. Uh, but they're overcrowded uh, big time. So, But, there, yeah, a lot of uh, other counties have expanded their jails or built no ones. You're correct. 